Okay, welcome everyone to Fruits of the Orchard. Tonight we're starting a new book, the Book of Bamidbar. And we begin with the first Parsha, which is also called Bamidbar. And we have three, three different Torahs in Fruits of the Orchard. Hopefully we'll get through all three ideas tonight. So the first one is called The Silent Speech of the Desert. <clears throat> so this is based on a midrash that says that the Torah was given through three different uh, agencies or, or things, through fire, through water, and through the desert. So we want to understand that a little bit. What does it mean that the Torah was given through fire? Now, this is coming right after Lagba Omer. Lagba Omer was last week, and the, call it the main custom of Lagba Omer is lighting bonfires. That became the, we'll call it the symbolic uh, action of Lagba Omer. And for those who were with us last Tuesday, so we learned the idea of the fire represents the fire of Torah and the passion of the soul to understand the Torah. And our connection to Torah, it's uh, expressed in the book of uh, Devarim in Deuteronomy in the last Parsha, where the Torah is called Eish Dat Lamo, a fiery law for, for those uh, who receive it. It's, it's, it's fire because the soul is fire and the Torah is our guidebook to how does the soul uh, conduct itself within the body in its journey in this world. And we know in the description of receiving the Torah at Sinai, that God came down on fire onto the mountain. This might be the, the source of the famous song, uh, Fire on the Mountain. <laughs> For those who can remember back to the, uh, the, I guess the 70s, Fire on the Mountain. But that's exactly how Mount Sinai is uh, described. It was on, on fire. And also it says that the mountain was Ashan Kulo, was full of smoke. So these are just different expressions of the idea that the, the Torah is given in fire. Then it says that the Torah is given through water. So this is uh, more hidden. There's a number of descriptions of the giving of the Torah at Sinai in the Torah. And one of them, and only one of them, mentions that there was a stream running down Har Sinai. It's not mentioned in any of the other ones, but after they worshiped the golden calf, it said that God, uh, Moshe, after he broke the tablets, he, he took the golden calf and he ground it up and he mixed it with water from the Nachal that was coming down from Mount Sinai. And he, he made everyone drink from it. So this is the only uh, mention of a physical stream or water connected with Mount Sinai. But symbolically, we're told that water, the nature of water is the opposite of fire. The nature of fire is to flame upward. It's always attempting to, to raise itself up higher. Water is just the opposite. Water always seeks the lowest place that it can flow to. 
So this is symbolic of Torah itself. Torah is coming from the infinite light of God, the infinite will of God, and it seeks to flow into this world and reach even the, the lowest of worlds, which is the world that we inhabit, called Olam Asiya, the world of action. And Torah comes all the ways down, just like, just like water. And there's, there's a verse that says, Nachal Novea Mikor Chachma, that a stream flows from the source of wisdom. And this stream is the stream of, of Torah. It's a stream of wisdom, of Chachma coming into the world. As it says in the Zohar, Torah Mikachma Nafkat. Torah flows out of wisdom. It is an expression of God's wisdom. And so this is compared to water, water flowing into the world. And who is the one who received the Torah for, for Israel and really the whole world was Moshe. And Moshe gets his name, Mina Mayim Mishitihu. The, the daughter of Pharaoh names him Moshe because from the water I have drawn him. So in a simple literal meaning, it's the, the Nile River. Moshe was drawn from the Nile River. But in a more spiritual way, the soul of Moshe is coming from the water of wisdom. He's draw, his soul is drawn from the infinite wisdom of God. And that's what made him the fitting vessel to be able to receive the Torah for all of Am Yisrael. And the third thing the Midrash says is, and we're bringing this whole Midrash really for this one, is the Torah was given in the Midbar, in the desert. That, of course, is the name of the entire book usually translated as a book of numbers. But in Hebrew, a midbar means in the desert. And of course, most of the uh, 40 years in the desert takes place in the book of Bamidbar. And so that is our, our Torah portion of the week. And so what does it mean that the Torah was given in the in the desert. What is what's the importance that it was in the desert of Sinai? So we're told that the desert, the nature of, of a desert uh, elicits humbleness in the soul. Because the desert is uh, seems to be more barren than other places in nature. There's a starkness about the desert. And what we're going to talk about now is there's an awesome silence in the desert. Because when you're out in the desert, you're usually far away from uh, society. You're far away from cities and towns. You're really, really isolated out in the desert. And we, there, there's a long tradition, especially because much of Israel can be uh, categorized as desert, even though in our day, a miracle is happening that Israel is turning the desert into a, an, an oasis, into an agricultural miracle. But still, Israel is a, a good part of being a desert. And we see it throughout the Tanakh, a tradition of our, our patriarchs and our matriarchs and the elders and the prophets who went into the desert in order to commune with God and to 
ready themselves to become fitting vessels for prophecy. And that's because there, this, this startness, this getting back to essentials that one can feel in the desert. So there's a paradox at work here because the, the nature of the desert is this, this awesome silence. And I should mention before we get into that, that the other thing that the uh, Midrash mentions is the idea of humbleness. That the desert represents humbleness. Again, it's, it's, it's just like getting back to essentials. There's a, a quiet there, there's a, a starkness, a barrenness that's not necessarily negative, but it's just getting back to core principles. And so the, the Midrash says that when God wanted to give the Torah, all the mountains wanted to be chosen as the one that God gave the, the Torah on. And God picked Mount Sinai because it's not this huge mountain. It's considered a relatively small mountain, and therefore it represented humbleness. And so our sages tell us that in order to really absorb the Torah, integrate the Torah, we have to be in a state of humbleness. So now let's go back to this idea of the silence. So there's a paradox here because if you take the word midbar and you just uh, change the vowels very slightly, instead of midbar, it's middaber. It, Midaber means to speak. And yet, there, uh, throughout our tradition, there is the quality of, of silence that is associated with the desert. And yet the desert means midaber. So going back to the idea that the uh, prophets in all of our patriarchs and what we call the Ushpizing, our shepherds, they all spend time out in uh, nature and uh, especially with uh, their flocks in semi-desert or desert uh, situations. And being a shepherd is, uh, is very good if one wants to commune with God because one needs to stay away from other people's fields and, uh, and, and keep the sheep or the goats or the cows, whatever, away from everyone else. And so there is a, an isolation feeling in the desert. And this is exactly the type of quality that the, the desert engenders in, in people. And so the, 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 the great prophets and our shepherds and the patriarchs and the matriarchs would, would spend time in the desert and the silence would actually open up the place that they could hear the word of God. They could hear middaber. They could hear the voice speaking to them. So in the book, I, I share a, a story. And it was, it was just an awesome experience. So I'm going I'm to tell it now, is going back to between 1995 and 2000. So I was the director of a group called Visa, Visiting Israel Students Association. And we used to have very, very uh, large Shabbatonim. And we would take the students from five different universities in Israel, students doing their uh, year abroad, English speakers. And we would go to different places in Israel and take whole hotels, whole youth hostels, 
and have these amazing, amazing Shabbatons. So one of the places that we used to go to was Mitzpah Ramon. Mitzpah Ramon is in the Negev Desert, and it sits, the town of Mitzpah Ramon sits on the largest natural crater in the world. It's, co it's, it's called the Crater of Mitzpah Ramon, and it's the largest natural crater in the world. It, some people call it the, the Grand Canyon of Israel. It's an awesomely beautiful place. So we used to take groups of students there, and we're, and we're talking about between 100 and 150 students. And so on Friday, we went hiking, we would go hiking all day and get back in enough time to prepare for Shabbat. So here we were, uh, close to 150 students taking a trip through the uh, crater and climbing the, the mountains around the crater. And so it, it, was, it was quite hot and we got to a place where there was a, a bunch of shade because of the, of the cliffs. And so we took that opportunity to, to sit in the shade and just uh, uh, rest for a while. And so while we were there, I took the opportunity to give over some of the teachings that I just gave over about the nature of the desert, the idea of the silence, and also the speaking of the desert. And very uh, spontaneously, I really had not planned this out whatsoever. I said, let's try an experiment. Everyone get very comfortable. Let's see if we can just for even two, three minutes, just listen to the silence of the desert. And I explained that most people have never really heard silence because when we're in our houses, we hear the refrigerator buzzing. When we're outside, we hear the electric lines buzzing. There's cars whizzing by. There's uh, traffic. There are birds singing. There's airplanes going by. When, when we think about it, we hardly ever experience actual silence. So I said, let's do an experiment. Get, get comfortable. No one move a limb. <laughs> no coughing, no sniffing. And let's see if we can hear this, the silence. So I was, I was, uh, had a lot of mazel that um, during the, I don't know how long it was, it seemed like almost forever. It was probably three minutes on a clock, but no planes went by. We were definitely near, we weren't near any roads, no electric lines, no cars, no birds, and we all sat there, this is 150 people. We all sat for a couple of minutes and it was absolutely quiet. And it was, it was truly an amazing, awesome experience. I don't think I myself had ever really been able or even thought about listening to silence. So I'll just encourage everyone, if you ever, it's not so easy to find. It's really not so easy to find where you can go, where there's absolutely no background sound. But if you have the chance, it really is an awesome experience. And so that's what we're, we're talking about here. And this silence, in the desert that speaks is what's called chashmal. Chashmal in modern Hebrew means electricity, 
but its original source comes in the vision of Ezekiel, the first chapter of Ezekiel, where along with many phenomena that he was experiencing in this vision that we call the working workings of the chariot. It's one of the basics of, of early Kabbalah, the early mystical tradition of Judaism. And in it, he mentions that he perceived an energy which he called Chashmal. There's no real description. So the sages wanted to uh, try to describe what was this energy or this color or this, this phenomena that he was experiencing. So they explained it that the word Chashmal has two syllables. The first one is Chash, which means silence. And the second syllable means mal, which means one of the words to speak. A word in Hebrew is called a milah, a word. Mi yamalel gevura tashem. Who will express, who will say, who will speak the, 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 the might of God? That's a verse. So here we have a paradox. Is it chash or is it mal? Is it silent or is it speaking? So the, 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 the sages continue and say, this is describing a, a type of angel that sometimes is silent and sometimes are speaking. Well, that's like a human being. Sometimes we are silent, sometimes we speak. But what's really explained is we're talking about a simultaneous uh, action where we have what's called the speaking silence or the silence that speaks. And so probably the most famous story in, in the Tanakh, the Bible, of this idea of the speaking silence is when Eliyahu Navi, Elijah the prophet, is being pursued by Ahab and Isabel, the king and the queen, and they have killed all the prophets. And Elijah runs to the Sinai desert to escape. And he comes to Mount Sinai. And he hides in the cave. And God comes to him and says, Eliyahu, anyone who's interested, this is in the book of Kings, in the, the, the first book of Kings. God comes and says, what are you doing here, Eliyahu? And Eliyahu says, I'm, I'm, I'm running for my life. They've killed all of the prophets, and they want to kill me as well. So as part of this whole revelation, there's Eliyahu is in a cave, and there's this tremendous wind comes. And it, it was so uh, unnatural that Eliyahu thought that God was in the wind. But then it says, but God was not in the wind. And then there was a fire. It was like the whole mountain was being consumed in fire. But God was not in the fire. And then there was the earth shook. And again, Eliel thought, this is what God, this is where God is. This is how God is, is expressing himself or manifesting himself. But it says. God was not in the, the shaking of the earth. And then it says, and then Eliyahu heard, call the mama daka, a small, silent voice, or a thin, silent voice. And he, he knew that God was in the silent voice. So this is one of the stories in the Tanakh 
that is based on this idea of the speaking silence. And of course, this is all coming from the idea of the midbar as being a place of awesome silence, but middaber, but the, but the desert and really all of nature speaks to us. So there's a beautiful uh, insight from the Balaturim. So again, in Hebrew, the, this thin, silent voice is called kol dmama daka. And actually, this is really, this concept became very famous because of the song from Simon and Garfunkel, The Sounds of Silence. They based a whole song around this concept of the sounds of silence. So the Balaturim says that this word daka, like thin or um, almost immaterial uh, silent voice, daka, only appears two times in the Tanakh. One time in the story that we just told, this thin uh, silent voice. And the other time is when describing in the parsha of uh, Achrei Mot, in the book of Leviticus, describing the incense that the Kohen Gadol, the high priest, would take into the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur. And it said that he would, gr the, the, the Kohen Gadol would grind the Bissamim Daka, very, very um, fine like almost like a, a dust. And the Balaturim says these are the only two times this word appears in the Tanakh. And so there's a deep, deep connection because we're told that spiritually, we don't have a temple now. We don't have a holy of holies now. So where is this concept in our our contemporary life. And so the idea that's given over in Hasidut is the point of godliness within each person. That is the place of the Kadosh Kadoshim, the Holy of Holies. And when one goes in side, deeply inside, that's where we have the opportunity to access this thin, silent voice. Just like Eliyahu Navi understood that that's, that was God speaking to him, but there was no audible voice. It was a state of consciousness that there was silence, but in the silence, God was speaking to him. And so we all have that that nakuda, that point, that possibility within ourselves. I'll end this first uh, idea from the fruits of the orchard with a beautiful gematria that the gematria bamidbar equals 248 equals Avraham. And we said that there was a, uh, a, a custom for the prophets to go out into the desert. Well, the first person in the Torah that is called a prophet is Avraham. Avraham, in a sense, is the archetype of a, of a prophet. And he also spent a good part of his life in the desert and was inspired through those experiences until he merited the, the level of being a prophet, of receiving prophecy from God. Okay, so that was the first idea that we wanted to cover tonight. 
The next one is called a holistic worldview. For those who have Fruits of the Orchard, it's on page 363. So there's a very, very important idea here. Many people read the book of the, the, the Parsha Bamidbar, and it's a lot of numbers. That's why in English, even though numbers is not a correct uh, translation of the word Bamidbar, but it does capture the, the, the theme because the whole first Parsha is about the census that was taken and went through each tribe. And then it went through how the tribes were uh, encamped in the desert and how they marched in the desert. So, so there's a lot of repetition, <clears throat> a lot of numbers, and many people are, how do we relate to this today? What, what are we to learn from this today? Well, just like everything in the Torah, there's an immense amount of things to learn from it. <clears throat> what we're going to do is, is focus just on one idea, but it's a very, very important idea. So one of the ways that the census was taken is from the second chapter in Numbers, and it says, God spoke to Moshe and Aaron, saying, each man by his banner, according to the insignias of their father's house, the children of Israel shall encamp. At a distance from the tent of meeting, they shall encamp. So what do we learn from this this verse here. First of all, that in the middle of the camp was the tabernacle. This symbolizes that the Torah is the central focus of our lives as individuals and as a, as a nation. We surround the Torah, and that is, the, we'll call it the heart of our existence the heart of the Jewish people. But here, the way, and we can't go through all of the verses, <clears throat> but the way that the census was taken and the way that the description of the tribes, at first, each tribe was numbered by themselves. And then there were three tribes on, in each direction surrounding the tabernacle. And so then there's another count of the three tribes together. So what we see here, if we follow carefully, we see that each root soul, and we're told that the census came to approximately 600,000. This is a very, very important number when it comes to the Jewish people because it's explained that technically in this Parsha, this, the census was for those who are of army age, between 20 and 60. That was considered you were uh, capable or you were fitting to be in the army if needed be. Now remember that we were on our way to Israel. We had received the Torah, and then we stayed at Mount Sinai for, for almost an entire year. And now we are starting to march towards Eretz Israel. Unfortunately, we ended up sending 12 spies, and they came back after 40 days with a very negative report and the people lost hope and even considered going back to Egypt. And that caused us to be, uh, to wander in the desert for 40 years. But 
at this juncture of the Torah, we're getting ready to march into Eretz Yisrael and to conquer Eretz Yisrael. And so the 600,000 count is literally the men between 20 and 60. We're told that one midrash says that there were 600,000 women and 600,000 children, along with the 600,000 men. But on a deeper Kabbalistic level, we're told that the 600,000 represents what are called root souls. There are 600,000 root souls in Israel. And that means that because everyone would ask, well, today, supposedly, there's uh, 13 or 14 million Jews in the world. Well, what does it mean that there are only 600,000 root souls? Well, a root soul is like an extended family. Hundreds of people can belong, as it were, to the same root soul. Anyways, the point here is that when the census was taken, the description is each person was counted alone, was, like we said before, camped by their, in the house of their family. They were part of a individual tribe. That individual tribe then grouped together with three other tribes in one of the directions around the tabernacle. And it's described like we, we read that everyone was at a distance from the tent of meeting. So here we have five different, we'll call it levels of association or identification. This is a, an incredibly important idea for us, not only today, but in every generation. In other words, each person is counted as an individual, but is also part of a family. And that family is part of a tribe. And that tribe is part of a a larger group of tribes called a nation. And that nation is part of the entire human race. And so we have these five levels of identification that each and every one of us needs to relate to because no... Um, <laughs> I mentioned Simon and Garfunkel before. So on the same album um, of The Sounds of Silence, they had, I remember a song, I am a rock, I am an island. But we have the expression, no person is an island alone. The way that God created the world is we're meant to interact with other people to be part of a family, to be part of a community, to be part of a, uh, a nation, to be part of the human race. And so each and every one of us has a certain level of identification on all of these different levels. And they're all important. And they all ex express something different about ourselves and the, the type of uh, connection that we need to have with all of these different, different levels. So I remember going back to the 70s and 80s, we had in the Moshav, uh, it was called the Midrashah Le'adut, a, um, a, a how do you say, Midrashah, a, like a, 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 a Jewish school. <laughs> and we used to receive groups, all kinds of groups, English speakers, Israelis. And part of what we did was we ran a bar and bat mitzvah program for sixth and seventh graders in Israeli schools. 
And they would come to us for a whole day and we would have different programs with them and, and learn different things. And one of the things we did is exactly what we're describing today because we, we tried to emphasize that when they became bar and bat mitzvah, so they, they become responsible for doing the mitzvot. But what that means really is being part of something much greater than themselves. And so as, as a child, we're, we're aware of our own being and we're aware of being in a family, but children aren't necessarily that tuned in to be part of a bigger community or, or all of Am Yisrael. Uh, it comes, it comes. But as we reach Bar and Bat Mitzvah, the age of 12 and 13, we become more and more aware of the type of responsibilities in our, uh, our status, our, our, our standing within all these different uh, associations or identifications of groups of people. So, what I wanna do now, I wanna read, I might have done this before in a different context that some of you might have heard, but for those who have Fruits of the Orchard, you can follow this on page 365. There's an awesome, awesome uh, teaching from Rav Cook. Rav Cook was the first chief rabbi, but at that point it was called Palestine. It, it, was, it, it was not Israel yet. He was the first chief rabbi. Rav Cook, and what, what I'm going to read now is uh, something that he wrote, and it it applies exactly to what we were just speaking about, and it, it, it's become a very uh, important source of inspiration for me personally. Uh, he he was a poet. He wrote. I, I, we're reading the translation from his original Hebrew, but even in the English, his, he, he had a poetic, mystical soul, and he expressed himself that way. So I'm gonna read this and you'll, you'll, be, you'll, you'll see immediately the connection to what I was just teaching about the different levels of association and identification that we can learn from the, the actual verses in this week's Parsha. So this is what Rev Cook says. There are those who sing the song of their own life and in themselves find everything, their full spiritual satisfaction. There are others who sing the song of their people, leaving the circle of the individual self because they find it without sufficient breadth, without an idealistic basis. They aspire towards the heights and attach themselves with gentle love to the whole community of Israel. Together they sing her songs. They feel grieved in her afflictions and delight in her hopes. They contemplate noble and pure thoughts about her past and her future and probe with love and wisdom her inner spiritual essence. There are others who reach towards more distant realms and go beyond the boundary of Israel to sing the song of humanity. Their spirit extends to the wider vistas of the majesty of humanity generally and its noble essence. They aspire towards humanity's general goal and look forward towards its higher perfection. From this source of life, they draw the subjects of their meditation and study, guiding their aspirations and visions. Then there are those who rise towards wider horizons until they link themselves with all existence, with all God's creatures, with all worlds, 
and they sing their song with all of them. It is of one such as this that tradition has said that whoever sings a portion of song every day is assured of having a share in the world to come. And then there are those who rise with all the songs in one ensemble, and they all join their voices. Together they sing their songs with beauty. Each one lends vitality and life to the other. They are sounds of joy and gladness, sounds of jubilation and celebration, sounds of ecstasy and holiness. The song of the self, the song of the people, the song of humanity, the song of the world, all merge within them at all times in every hour. And this full comprehensiveness rises to become the song of holiness, the song of God, the song of Israel in its full strength and beauty, in its full authenticity and greatness. The name Israel stands for Shir El, the song of God. It is a simple song, a twofold song, a threefold song, and a fourfold song. It is the song of songs of Solomon, Shloma, which means peace or wholeness. It is the song of the king in whom is wholeness. So what a beautiful, beautiful way to look at life and to live life. Rav Cook gave us a, a, a real treasure here. And even though his imagery is based around song, it's very, very connected to what we were learning about. As, as expressed in this week's parsha of, of, of singing the song of the self, the song of one's family, the song of one's tribe or community, the song of one's nation, all of Israel, and, and the song of all of humanity, because in the middle of the camp was the Mishkan, was the Torah. And ultimately, the Torah is meant for the whole world. So this is the idea that I wanted to give over. It's a very, very important idea. So we read this Parsha, and it does seem very repetitious, but we have to like cut through and see how it builds from the individual to the family, to the tribe, to the nation, and ultimately to the whole world. Okay, one last article we have here called the 12 tribes and the 12 months. So this is a very, very important idea that in the Sefer Yitzira, the Sefer Yitzira is considered the, the first book of Kabbalah. And it's really based on three numbers, three, seven, and 12. And, and it mentions that these three numbers are significant because the Hebrew letters, the 22 Hebrew letters, are divided in the Sefer Yitzira into three groups. The first group are called the mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Shin. And it, 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 it turns out that this picture behind me is a representation of these three superimposed on the Sfirot. That the Aleph is, is for Avir, air. And this is in the middle of the spherot where the lungs are. The shin is fire, ash. And this is between chachma and bina. This is the fire of the intellect. And the mem is between netzach and hod. This is the place of the digestive system in a human being, which is based on water. 
So these three are, are called the three elements of air, water, and fire. So that is the first grouping of the 22 letters, are called the three mother letters. Then there's what's called the seven double letters. These are the letters that can be pronounced in two different ways. Bet and vet, chaf and kaf, pe and fe. And there's actually four more that you have to be really good in, <laughs> in Hebrew grammar to, to really know the difference. But gimel, uh, resh, tough, and dalad also actually have two different uh, 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 pronunciations. So those are the seven double letters. And then there are 12 simple letters. Now the Sefer Yitzira then takes these three groupings and associates them with other groups of three, seven, and 12. For example, we'll just do it in time. The three represent three seasons. What's interesting, even though most of us, uh, for good reason, associate with four seasons. In Israel, there's more of the idea of three seasons, a rainy season called winter, a dry season called summer, and a very short spring and fall between them. And depending on the year, you could really spring could already be very, very hot and it's all and already dry. So the three letters represent the three seasons. The seven represent the seven days of the week. And the 12 represent the 12 months of the year. I, I said all of that to get to the idea of the 12 months because the, the 12 months are also connected to the 12 mazalot, the 12 constellations, and especially the ones we know about in astrology, the different constellations and the astrological signs. Later, it's not in the Sefer Yitzira, but later more and more associations were connected to these numbers, three, seven, and 12. And one of them was the 12 tribes are now connected to the 12 months. And that's what this article is about because there's two versions of how to associate the tribes with the months. And the first one is based on the Zohar and the, what we'll call the early Kabbalah, where we start the months in Nisan. Nisan is the, the new year of the months. We have a new year of months and a new year of years. Rosh Hashanah, which we usually uh, relate to as the new year, but it's actually the seventh month of the year. It's, a, it's the new year of years, but the new year of months starts in Nisan. And so the Zohar made the, the correspondence of each month to the birth order of the 12 tribes. Because that, that is a natural connection because the 12 tribes are connected to the 12 months and are connected to the 12 astrological signs. But interesting, the, the Arizal, the great Kabbalist of Sfat, whose teachings are totally based on the Zohar. He was, in a sense, the first person to really understand the Zohar is he, he plumbed the depths of every word in the Zohar. 
Nonetheless, he changed the order of the associations of the tribes with the months. And he did it according to this week's Parsha, the order in which the tribes camped in the desert and they marched when they moved from place to place. And so the question is, why, why did the Ari change this? When, when so much of his teachings was to reveal the inner dimension of what the Zohar is talking about. The Zohar is written in, in, in very symbolic, uh, enigmatic, uh, we'll call it even code language. And you have to understand the, the code to understand what it's talking about. But here the Arizal, he changed the order and he explained that he considered the, the order that the tribes are described because the way that they camped in the desert and the way they're counted in this week's Parsha and the way that they marched is not by birth, is not by birth. And the Arif felt that this was, I'll use the word mature, developed association between the months and the tribes. Now, this is based on a very, very important idea that relates to all of us. And that's what's called Teva Rishon and Teva Sheni, our first nature and our second nature. What does this mean emotionally and psychologically and spiritually? We are all products of what we'll call nature and nurture. We're born with a certain DNA code. We're born into a certain race, a certain religion or family that holds by a certain culture or family. Most people are born into a certain religion. And we, we also have a DNA code that establishes the, at least the parameters of our physical existence. It does not uh, mandate absolutely, but it does set a certain um, context in which our physical bodies uh, play themselves out. So we're a product of nature and nurture. We're raised in a certain way, in a certain uh, uh, worldview. We're affected deeply by peer pressure, by the, the type of society that we're born into. If we're born into an age where there's war, then that affects us deeply. If we're born into a rich family, or we're born into a poor family, well, that determines so much of who we end up being. That's all call, called Teva Rishon, our first nature. But then there's what's called Teva Sheni. That's what we do with those parameters of nature, nurture, and DNA that were given, like the cards that were dealt. This, our, our second nature is, well, what do we do with them? Some people can, are, are, are served up lemons and are bitter their whole lives. Other people are served up lemons and they make lemonade with lots of sugar <laughs> or honey in it sweet lemonade. In other words, we have a context, we have parameters, but we have a lot of free will. And that's expressing what's called our second age. That's what we do to develop what we've been given. Now, I learned from Rob Ginsburg, a beautiful gematria is the, the words teva sheni, second nature equals 
And I see Nachum also learned it because he just posted it on the chat. He learned the same Torah that I did. Equals 441. Equals emet, truth. In other words, our truth is what we make of the hand that we're dealt. The hand that we're dealt is not our true being. It's our, it's our um, what's called Homer Gellum. It's, our, um, it's the materials with which we can build our lives. Many people are born with great talents and they squander them, squander them or never develop them. Other people don't have certain talents naturally, but they work so hard and they develop them and they become masters of them. It all depends on what we do with it. And so the Tevashani is called our, our, our true being. And that's what the Ariza was getting at. That when he looked at the different orders in which the tribes are mentioned, he, he felt that a more true or mature connection between tribe and month was in our Parsha, the way that we, uh, we camped and marched in the desert. And like so much, it's not like the it's not like the Zohar was wrong. That's not the point here. It's just that the the Ari was was revealing a deeper connection. Now, I'm just going to mention this, and we'll end with this: that this idea that begins in the Sefer Yitzira has been developed. Uh, tremendously. I see that Randy just put uh, one of the books is called Above the Zodiac by uh, Glazerson, where, and she's even holding it up there, um, where it, it talks about all the different associations with the months. Each month, as we said, has a letter, but it's tremendously significant. And in fact, the language of the Zohar is not so much that the month, we're in the month of Iyar. The month of Iyar is represented by the letter Vav. That's not how it's stated. It's stated that through the letter Vav, the month of Iyar was created. That's a very, very different uh, understanding of the connection between the letter and the month. Every month, as we said, has a connection to a tribe, has a connection to a part of the body, has a connection to a sense, has a connection to an element of fire, earth, air, and water, has a connection to an astrological sign. And Many, many books are out there. Anyone can uh, Google them. They're on uh, uh, Amazon, they're available. And these are tremendously helpful connections to understand what is the energy of the month that we live in. And so, one of the many associations with the 12 months are the 12 tribes. And because of the tremendous influence of the Arizal, almost everyone makes the association between tribe and month according to the Ari. Because he was, in a sense, considered like the, the last word in like almost everything in Kabbalah is he's like the last word. So we'll just end because this month is the letter Vav and it's the tribe of Yisachar. And uh, Yisachar was considered among the wisest of the tribes. It says 200 heads of the Sanhedrin 
came from the tribe of Yisachar, and he knew the secrets of time. Now that's interesting because what are we doing now? We're counting the Omer. We're counting the days between Pesach and Shavuos. Every day we're counting the days. So it's connected to the tribe of Yisachar. Anyways, I'll bless everyone to really delve into these, these connections. And it's really connected to this week's Parsha. This week's Parsha is very, very, very much what we we'll call the headquarters of the, this, this number 12 because of the, 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 all of the census and the tribes and the encampments and the marching. It has very, very much to do with this idea. So we should all be blessed to live with the times.